so years. We've had over a hundred families now come through this program. We've seen some incredible things happen. I've got some of the boys uh, from here as well. Uh, that's cool. Um, we now run a father and son camp as well, which is something that is so, so uh, dear to our hearts. You want to know why? Uh, because it was a father and son relationship that transformed the world. And the enemy is so after the relationship of fathers and their sons. Because he knows if he can mess it up, he can mess up a young person's view of, of their heavenly father as a result of their earthly father. And so at this camp, we did some pretty cool outdoor stuff, as you can see. And then there are just some really beautiful moments of fathers embracing their sons, speaking life over them, declaring a blessing over them. And uh, the sons also did like a little ceremony at the end as well, something that we are very, very passionate about. You know what? Society needs more strong, godly men. And so it's something that we're really, really passionate about. And also, uh, I want to share this as a bit of an inspiration. Uh, so some of you would know, most of you would know, in high school, I had four suspensions to my name. Uh, <laughs> uh, my first day of school in New Zealand, 1992, I couldn't speak a word of English. And when I look back on my life, when I look back on my gangster days, they used to call me Easy E from Ringwood Secondary College. I'd be like, yo, what side? The old has gone. Behold, all things are new. All right, I'm a new creation. But I'm, I am a living witness of what God can do when he grabs a hold of a person's life. And the reason why my wife and I, we've got a mission to reach one million youth by 2031. The reason why is because when I was a young person, I was way off. But there are some people who believed in me. And that's why every young person that I see, every young person, I don't care what your addictions are. I don't care, you know, how atheist you are. Every single young person that I meet, that I see, I have this faith in me for them that God can use their lives as well. Because if he did it for me, then he can do it for them as well. And I am a living testimony of what, what God can do in your life when you surrender your life to him. And you follow him fully. Can I just say this? A lot of times our Christian walk, we, we don't go all in. And then our response is, well, God's not showing up. The Bible says God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Not just those who seek him. Dil the word diligent means earnestly, means persistent. It means week after week. It, it's not a, oh, I'll rock up to church maybe once every couple of months and I'll just tick the box and I'll pray, but, I, but I'll pray at church. And when I go home, it doesn't. The Bible says he's a rewarder of those who diligent. It's like, it's like tithing. When it come, for those of you who are familiar with tithing, the Bible says bring 10%. Guess what? If you bring 9%, that's not diligent. That's just finding a way to cut corners. And so can I encourage you? It's one, I'm so glad you're here, but can I challenge you in your faith? And this is coming from someone who, for seven years of my teenagehood, my parents would drag me to Heathmont Baptist Church. I hated being there. And today, I'm all in. Today, I'm all in. I refuse to be a part-time Christian that wants a full-time blessing from God. Leave the blessing aside. I refuse to be a part-time Christian when there is an enemy who is working overtime. And that's, that's why we, 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 we lose the battles in life. That's why for young people, mental health is at a crazy all-time high. And our boys are like telling, uh, yo, but I'm, I just want that level on Call of Duty. Yeah, bro, you want the world online, but can you win the spiritual battle? Because one day when, we, when we're men, we are families, and our little one is sick, and they need a hand to be laid upon in the name of Jesus to be prayed over them. What relevance and significance has a game that I won online got to do with a life that needs a touch from God? I refuse. This is not in my notes, but I want to encourage you. God can take you from that, can turn you into this. When you go all in, not just a little bit in, but every part of you. 
I love it when David says, one day in your courts is better than a thousand days elsewhere. One day, he says, I'd rather be a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord than be anywhere else. You know, Psalm 23 that we talk about, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still. The next verse after that, David says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that I will seek after, that I may dwell in his presence all the days of my life, that I may dwell upon his beauty. It makes sense because David's life was under threat. It makes sense that he found safety in the house of God because he had a soul that was after his life. He had a storm, but he had a foundation. You know, there's actually a verse, I love this, and we used to pray this in Africa, and it was this verse in Psalms. It says, I shall not die, but I will live to declare I feel the power of, I will live to declare the works of the Lord. And I wonder, in a generation where between 12 and 25, the biggest killer is suicide. I wonder what would happen if we would stand up. And we would declare, I shall not die, but I shall live. This depression, this anxiety, I shall not die. You see, David had a soul. For us, we don't have a soul who's pursuing our lives, but we got some mental health challenges that every day in our ears are telling us, you're not worthy. You're not good enough. Why are you even here? You don't belong. Maybe I'm just speaking from experience. Because in 2002 in Ghana, I attempted suicide twice. And those were some of the very words. After that, I gave my life to Christ. I wonder what would happen and what the statistics would look like if a generation rose up and began to pray and declare, I shall not die, but I will live to declare. Oh, and by the way, I'm not just going to live, like just exist. John 10, verse 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy. But I, Jesus, I have come that you may have life, comma, and life to the full. See that? I'm going all in. I'm living life to the fullest, not just existing. I'm not just going to be here. Uh, In Genesis, the Bible says that Adam On the sixth day, you know, so God obviously, you know, day by day, creation was rolling, right? The script was rolling and day by day, okay, all right, the sea, the sun, all right, all of that. Then the animals, day by day, he was feeling the earth. Then Adam comes along. The Bible says he formed man out of the dust of the earth. He didn't stop there. The Bible says, and he breathed into man and man became a living being. In other words, Adam went from just being a man to becoming a man of God. Why? Because he had a spirit of God in him. It's not enough to just exist. It's not enough to just get up and go to school and come back home and scroll a little bit and then go to bed and just check for a couple of seconds the Bible app and all right, cool, and and move on. It's not enough. There is a heavenly creator that wants intimacy with each and every one of us. There is a God who so loves each and every one of you. There is a God who has been calling you and knocking on your heart for such a long time. There is a God who desires to rescue you from what it is that you're going through because he has the answers. You guys remember some years ago, there was an interview of a particular person and he was like, you ain't got the answers, Sway. You ain't got, you know who got the answers? God's got the answers. And here we are, walking with our head down, carrying so much, when there is one who says, bring your burdens to me and I will carry them. Can I encourage you, after this conference, go all in. Some of you here, this is something that you need to hear. You're half in, that's great, that's a first step. 
God is waiting for the other foot to match up so he can show you everything that he has desired for you to have. Tonight, I want to speak on a topic that I call the P Foundation. Now, obviously, the, the text didn't fit on the screen. There is an N. Don't judge me and think, this guy can't even spell. No, there was an N. Can I get a witness? There was an N, wasn't there? There was. Mm -hmm. I want to um, speak to a message I call the P Foundation. You know, in life, every single one of us, we are building our lives upon a foundation. Every single one of us here. For me, uh, this is 1997. I'm trying to figure out why they're laughing. It's not working. Are you going to give me that one? Hello? Ooh. Shout out to the tech team. Let's give them a round of applause. Give them a round of applause. So, I remember at this age, I was told that I would never achieve anything because of the color of my skin. I was called the N-word at a primary school in Ringwood when I was the only African. And from a young age, you know what? I began building my life upon a foundation of people's perceptions, people's words. I was too young to articulate it to you like I just did. The truth is, everyone in this room right now, whether you know it or you don't, whether you're conscious of it or not, you are building your life upon something. I'm so glad for your pastors to host a conference like this. Because every building has a foundation. And it's better to check it earlier before you start building, then later, aka when you're married, aka got kids, later on in life, to look back and be like, ooh, I built on some wrong stuff. This conference over tonight, tomorrow, open your ears to God. Because he's going to give you some stuff to be able to build your life in a way that it's going to go high and it's going to glorify God. I was told I would never achieve anything. And for me, it became a foundation. I was too young to know any better. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know my identity. And then it showed up in my behavior, as I mentioned to you, it showed up my behavior at school because I, I, I was made to feel worthless. I began to follow these boys, a group at school, which ended up in all these suspensions. Can I say this to each and every one of us here today? The reality is you and I are building upon one or two foundations, either the world or the word. You'd be like, oh, he didn't say Jesus. I thought our foundation is Jesus. He's a solid rock upon which I stand. Well, that's a great question. Because John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. Oh, I love holding this. And the Word was God. And then if you scroll down, to verse 14, the Bible says, and the word became flesh and it dwelt amongst us. It's talking about Jesus. There are one of two foundations that right now you're building your life upon. One of them is the world. And what that looks like is your friendship groups, perhaps, and, you know, peer pressure from them, uh, social media and, and the influences and everything that the information that you are gathering through the music that you and I listen to. Oh yeah, once again, I fell to that when I was younger. MTV sold me some pretty deep lies. I want a refund, yo. Where can I sue them and get some? Anyway, they sold me some lies. 
It wasn't like I knew what was happening, but slowly it was being fed into my subconscious mind. And if I can be vulnerable with you because of that, because of the friends I was with, at that time, when it came to women, for example, I had a distorted view of women. In fact, the group that I used to hang around with, that would make jokes about certain girls and it would be seen as a number and as a conquest, something to be proud of when you have multiple girls. Like th- th- that was how messed up it was. That was my reality as a teenage boy. I was building upon a foundation that was the world. A foundation that would have me sink. It would be years later that I obviously would feel the consequence of my actions being sent to Ghana. And there I gave my life to Christ. And so tonight what I want to do in the next 15 or so minutes, I want to share some stuff with you on what this foundation is, what this P foundation is. And to, to further ado that, I want to share a story with you. This is uh, some, uh, some slab, right? Some slab for, for a house. Now, my wife and I, by God's grace, recently we got a block of land. We received a report, an email, and boy, I was like waiting for this email. And the report had the soil test results, which would mean how much we're paying for the foundation. So I scanned through this email and it was, you know, all, all the little subheadings and, you know, your slab is this and that, your land irrig- uh, irrigation, all these terminologies. I got to the end of it and it was a, it was a big fee. And here's what I learned. Because I questioned it. And they told me where your land is. These factors determine what kind of foundation we have to put down. What kind of slab. If it's H class or P class slab. Or sorry, uh, uh, what was it? Waffle slab, whatever it is. That we have to use. H slab. We have to use. We have to do that. There's no way around it. We can't take this this item out, this line item, it has to be in it because of where you are. I said, all right, cool. Won't argue with that. Let's go ahead. The test that they did, they sent out a guy, they called them soil surveyors, right? They got their little thing and little diggers and they dig into the soil and where they find rock and that's where they do their report. And so that was the report that he came back to give. In other words... Because of where the land was equated to the kind of foundation that we needed. Now, forget about Eric's land. Can I tell you something? The Bible says that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. In other words, you and I also have an address. It's called the world. We live in the world, but we're not of the world. And if you allow me for a few moments to come to you as a soil surveyor, as a culture surveyor, I analyzed the land and I've seen a couple of things about the land called earth that you and I live in, in particular, the culture of the day that you and I find ourselves in. You want to see the the analysis of this report? Let me show you. Let me me show you all. There's some depression, I see. Anxiety. Hopelessness. Anger. The report of the world that we live in. The Bible says that we live in a dark world. But Jesus says, fear not, for I have overcome it. And so in order for you and I, because of where we're at, Because of what we have around us, we have to build our lives on what I refer to as the P foundation. And for those of you that haven't guessed it already, it's a foundation of prayer. And the first question will probably, Eric, can you like, what is, what is prayer? And so just, just in a few moments, give me two minutes, let me uh, explain for those of you that may not be familiar with prayer. Uh, prayer, in simple terms, it's communication with God. Communication with God. 
Now, prayer is one of those things that in every religion, in every faith background, the common thread that actually ties all faith back together is the element of prayer. The Muslims believe five times a day, go down on your knees, bow your head, they pray. The Buddhists, what do they do? They have prayer as part of their faith. Even the atheists, the ones who believe in the universe, the ones who believe in crystals, they all have a form of prayer. Now, I have to make this very clear. Their prayer is is to a God, small g. But you and I in the Christian faith, when we pray, it's to the living God. You and I, when we pray, it's to a God who no longer is in the grave, but a God who resurrected on the third day. You know what that means? It means that when you pray, he has an ear to hear your prayers. Christianity is the only faith that prayer is a, is a dialogue and not a monologue. Every other faith, they pray, they don't hear anything back. But you and I, Serve a God who is alive. You and I serve a God who sits on his throne with his ear listening to the cry of his children. Thank you, Siri. To the cry of his children. We serve a living God. And all throughout the Bible, 850 plus times, prayer is mentioned over and over again. One of those plays I want to draw your attention to tonight is the book of Acts chapter 2. The Bible says, for those of you that know the the story of Acts chapter 2, it talks about the disciples who were gathered together in the upper room. This moment would be a very vital and pivotal moment in the history of the world. Because what they were doing in the upper room, as you can see here, the Bible says... You told me about it a little, like, thin, right? Oh, let me see if I can use it. I've never used it before. No? All good. Can we go back to, to, to the, oh, I can do that myself. They were in one accord in what? Prayer. They gathered together, and they were communicating with God. And the Bible says that as they were doing this, the day of Pentecost had now come. They were all together with one accord. They were praying. And as they were praying, the Bible said the Holy Spirit came upon every single one of them. Did you know that this Bible verse is the genesis of the church? The church that you and I call church. The church that you, your expression is revived church. This was where it was birthed. The foundation of the church was prayer. And in this room here tonight, can I say this? God loves it when his people gather together to pray. Because it sets heaven into motion. It enables God to discharge his angels to begin working on our behalf. Heaven loves it when we pray. The church, the foundation on prayer. Let me share with you something else. The second one here. Here we go. Personal uh, foundation. Now, uh, in 2002, after I gave my life to God, uh, a youth pastor at the church in Ghana, Action Chapel, uh, with the Archbishop Duncan Williams, who actually has three fing- uh, two fingers. He holds a microphone like this. He had three cut off in Nigeria because he, uh, he stole something, got caught, and back then they would... Uh, mm-hmm. And so he holds a microphone like this. This guy, he's, he's called the, um, the, the Prayer Apostle of Africa, okay? It was his church that I went to. And at his church, they had this mountain retreat where pastors would go and pray for months on end. I was selected as one of two people who were not pastors. Up until this point, the only prayer I've ever prayed in my life, Lord, bless my food in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Wake up in the morning. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That's, it. That's, that's as far as my prayer life goes. I go there. And these guys, they're praying in three-hour blocks. I see them walking the first, everyone, and they got like, 
They got like towels. This is a baby towel, by the way. They got like a whole beach towel. Walking in. And I'm like, what's going on? What are we about to do? There's no, pool, there's no water around here. Some of them actually walk in praying in tongues. Lebo ho shadabaha, le paralaba kapanda lebo ho shadabaha. And I'm like, what is going? Where have I come to? Three hour blocks, one meal a day, 5 30 p.m. every day. And in between, we just memorize scripture. They began to pray. First of all, they huddle. And one of them reads a verse, and then they begin to shout it out. Say, I declare, I declare, in the name of Jesus. And then we quote verses and scriptures. And something begun to happen on the inside of me. I mean, it was called exhaustion. I was, oh my God, after 30 minutes, I'm, I'm tired, y'all. Can, can we rest? But you know what happened? Because they were all pastors and this is what they do every day, it pushed me. That's why who you hang around with matters. If they're spiritual or if they're not, it matters. My goodness. And then I, I hadn't spoken in, in tongues before, so they, they prayed for me and, and I received it. And tonight we're going to pray for some people here tonight. I'm going to believe you can receive it as well. And then I, I be, began to pray in tongues. And, and so here I am praying every single morning during our, our prayer runs. And, and on the first morning, I, I felt this stitch in my stomach. Like when you go on a marathon, you get to a point. And, and I went to one of the guys, like very embarrassed. I'm like, I feel something on the inside of me. He goes, oh, oh, that one, eh? That one means you have come to the end of your physical ability, eh? Now is not the time to give up, my friend. You have to push, eh? Push. Pray until something, eh? Uh -huh. Push. He goes, now, the rest of this will be the Holy Spirit. I went back and joined the line. Hand to my ear. Lebo kodobohosh. And three hours went by. My towel was wet and I felt energized. And in a new presence of God I'd never experienced before in my life. As I stand here before you as a 37 year old, I can tell you something. The key foundation for the life that I live was birthed out of that place of prayer. It was that place that they gave me a Bible that was the King James Bible. And that's why my son's first, my son, my first son, his name is King St. James Argument. It was also that place where I prayed specifically for my wife in 2002, her nationality. And guess what, y'all? I nailed it. <laughs> Don't tell me prayer doesn't work. I've been at the receiving end of prayer. Every Friday night, we used to do what we call all-night prayers at Action Chapel, the youth department, 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. would pace up and down. They wouldn't let us sit and pray because they said prayer is spiritual warfare. No one goes into war with their little Aussie chair, with a little hole to put their stuff. Nah, mate. That's not the posture for fighting. You are standing up. You are moving with intention. You are praying. And over time, my goodness, it absolutely changed my life. And as I stand here tonight, can I, can I share a couple of things with you? If you've received Jesus in your life, you did this. You actually prayed. The book of Romans, the Bible says this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So at every church service, when they say, who wants to give the life to Christ? Raise your hand and say a simple prayer after. Prayer is your initiation into the kingdom of God. It's the foundation upon which we enter the kingdom of God. But the unfortunate reality and truth is this. For so many people, prayer is a one-time life event. It happened when they prayed for salvation, and it ended there. You know what? 
The enemy loves a Christian who doesn't pray. In fact, I would go as far as saying a week without prayer will make a Christian weak. A week? What? Because here is, here is the truth. You need food to physically survive. If you go 40 days without it, doctors will tell you it's not going to look too good for you. A certain amount of time you go without water, it's not going to be good for you. In the same way, prayer to the Spirit is what food is to our flesh. If you couldn't go a week without prayer, or if you're like me, you can't go two hours without eating, right? Then you and I, we need to pray. Now, Paul in the Bible says this. No, that's not Paul, but it's someone else. In Jude chapter 1, verse 20, it says this. It says, but you, referring to all of us. By the way, when you read the Bible, don't just like, but insert your name in there. Speaking to you. Speaking to you. He's speaking through the disciples to you. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you want to build up your faith, you need to add prayer to your daily routine. I love how Paul says it. He says, pray without season. I did a Google research on all the translations. It was pray without season, pray without giving up, always pray, continually pray. In other words, he was saying pray every single day. And can I say this? It doesn't have to be an hour prayer at each time you pray. It can just be, as I, I heard the, the ladies talking, it can be on the way to school. And instead of putting on the latest, I don't know, Cardi B, Nicki Minaj, whoever, whoever trash rapper is out there, putting their song on, have some worship music on, and just praying, Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you that I woke up for the breath in my lungs. I thank you that you go before me into this classroom and this school. And perhaps the day before you had an issue with someone, and Lord, I just pray that the teacher, so, so, and so, whoever it is, I just pray, Lord, that you would just touch their hearts, Father. I pray that as I go in today, Lord, that it will be a new day, a new star. Your word says that your mercies are new every single morning. Lord, I pray that you would watch over me today. I pray no accident in the name of Jesus, in the car that I'm in, on the train that I'm on, on the path that I walk. I pray that your angels will protect. We could turn it all around. That's how simple it is to make prayer a daily habit. We don't have to look ourselves in a room like those guys did in the prayer mountains, but it's in our everyday life. Prayer, the foundation, will absolutely change you and I, our lives. It builds our faith. And in Jeremiah 33, verse 3, it says, call on to me. In other words, he says, pray, and I will show you great and mighty things that you did not know. And here's what I want to want to share with you really quickly. It's like, Eric, you know, I, I hear what you're saying and 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 why why is why is prayer so important? Can I just share something with you? I don't have this verse up, but it's a verse that so many of you would most likely be familiar with. In the book of Philippians, it says, uh, do not worry about anything, but what? Do not worry about anything, but what? Pray about everything. It didn't say pray about some things. Can I tell you? I, some of you here are, are, are needing direction. Pray to Him. The very matters and issues in your life right now that you are stressed about, did you know in one moment you can turn that stress point around into a prayer point? Like, okay, so... You know, you're going through some, some friendship stuff or whatever it, it may be. It's causing you stress and anxiety. H how do we, Eric, turn that around to a prayer point so we're no longer anxious and worried? Well, it's like, Lord, I, I, I thank you for my friends. I thank you, Lord, for where you've positioned me. And, Lord, I just pray. I bring this situation that you already know to you. 
And Lord, I pray that you would give me peace in the midst of this situation. I pray, Lord, the next time I speak to this person, that whoever it is, I pray, Lord, that you would make the conversation a peaceful conversation. If you're here and you need finance or believing for a new job, pray. The Bible says that promotion doesn't come from the east or west or north. It comes from God. Pray that God, would you order my steps to the right company? Would you order my, you, pray, you believe in God for resource. You pray. It's, it, it's become a stress point. It's become a worry point. You turn around and say, Lord, I thank you today for what you've already blessed me with. And Lord, I pray your word says that you own a thousand cattle upon the hill. And as a child of God, I thank you. That though Jesus was poor, was rich, he became poor, that we might become rich. So, Lord, I claim every blessing you have for me, physical, spiritual blessing. I claim it in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, if you need wisdom, ask of him and he will freely give it to you. There is nothing that you need that God doesn't have. Let me say that again. There is nothing that you need that God doesn't have. When Jesus went to the man who was laying for 38 years by the pool, Jesus did not put his hand on him and say, ah, rise up, you are healed. He says, do you want to be made whole? The man had to speak. And sometimes we don't think we need to pray because we think God knows. God does know. But it takes your part. You and I, our part is prayer. He knew very well. I mean, he's. He's omnipresent. He's all-knowing. He knew this man needed healing. So why did he engage in a dialogue? with? Because he loves it when we pray to him. He's a God that loves the dialogue. So can I encourage you, whatever it is that's got a hold of you, whatever it is that's causing you stress, whatever it is that's causing you pain, there is a way that you can turn around. There is someone that you can turn it to. And his name is Jesus. And when you open your mouth and you begin to pray, he will take it all away. And you'll fill your heart with peace. You either have a prayer life or you have a worry life. But you can't have both. Philippians 4, 12. Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And when you go a little bit down, it says, and the God of peace will cause this peace that surpasses all understanding to come into your hearts. You are one prayer away from that anxiety letting go of your life. You and I are one prayer away from the hold of the enemy on our lives being dismantled. The foundation of prayer. Can I get the keys person up here right now? That would be amazing. And so tonight, here's what I'm believing for. I've got about three more minutes before I finish. But here's what I'm believing for. I'm believing that you and I will recommit to a daily prayer life. A foundation of prayer. But I'm also believing. We read a verse before in Romans. This verse right here. Let me bring it back up. It says, for we do not know how we ought to pray. Let me break that down for you. At that prayer camp, there is no way that I could have prayed for three hours in English. Yo, English is my second language. Bruv, our vocabulary is limited, eh? We don't speak English that well. There is no way that I could speak English, pray in English for three hours maximum maybe five then I run out of words I remember being told at the prayer camp I said Eric eh Quincy did you know that when you pray with in English did you know the enemy can hear and understand what you are saying eh I was like really I was like, and then he, went, he said but when you pray in tongues eh it is a heavenly language that the enemy cannot decode eh it's a heavenly language. The enemy can say, hey Siri, decode this prayer all he wants. And it cannot be decoded. Because it's a language between your spirit in you and God. 
So this verse is saying, for we do not know what to pray, how we ought to pray. I mean, at best, five, ten minutes. You know what he says? He says, but the Spirit of God, the, sp- the same Spirit that was breathed into Adam, that made him become a living being, the same Spirit that rose Christ from the dead, well, that same Spirit in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, that same Spirit that came upon them and that birthed the church, that same Spirit revived church is available to you and I. When that Spirit comes upon you, your prayer life, your prayer life, your prayer foundation goes to a whole nother level. Changes. You know, I wake up on most mornings at 5:30 a.m. intentionally because I believe that every 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 man, when you have a family, you are a priest. In the Old Testament, priests would be the ones that would pray. I believe that I am convicted that I have to I need to pray for my family, cover them, name, go through their names, and pray over them. Around 5 30 a.m. I'll be like, can't be honest with you. I pray in English tops about nine minutes. And that's all my thanksgiving. Because the Bible says in the Psalms, enter his courts with praise and his gates with thanksgiving, right? When you go to someone, you don't go, hey, can you give me? And I say, hey, thank you for everything and what you do and praise him. And I have a lot to praise him for. I was a kid in a gang. At 14, I was addicted to cigarettes. I had a porn addiction as well. I have a lot to be grateful for. I'm not even meant to, I'm not even meant to have a microphone in my hand. But let me tell a little secret. In New Zealand, at Kids Church, they were passing the offering basket around. This was, this was how heathen I was. I was like, ooh, ooh. I'm not even meant to be here. But God in His grace has me here. So I pray and I thank Him. I have certain songs that I play to glorify Him. And and then I I enter a new zone. It's a warfare zone. I quote scriptures. I declare some things. I submit our ministry to Him because He is the CEO. I'm just the steward of it. I pray for wisdom. I pray for divine connection. The Bible says people from the east and north. And I call them forth to come. Support what God has put in our hearts. If I'm going to a school that day, I'll pray over that school, over that year level. And then I break out, and I don't even know what I'm praying for. I'm just, I'm just declaring the Spirit. It's okay that I don't know what exactly I'm praying for because I'm not meant to. This is not an intellectual test. It's a spiritual thing. It says, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes with us, with groanings too deep to understand. And here's what I love at the very bottom. It says, the Spirit prays according to the will of God. In other words, when you pray only in English, you limit yourself from praying the will of God because you don't know the will of the specific will of God for your life. What the Spirit does it's one of the reasons, can I share that? It's one of the reasons why when Sen and I, we do programs and we run stuff, it's one of the reasons why I'm so confident. Oh, I'm so confident because I've prayed about it in the Spirit. I trust God that He's got an ear to hear. And then we just, we just do the thing, baby. We just, we just go on ahead. If we fail, we take the L, the lesson, we keep it moving. If it doesn't fail, oh, hello. To transform lives, that's what I'm talking about. Walk in confidence. Walk in confidence of your future. Why? Because you've prayed in the Spirit to God. I may not know tomorrow, but I know the one who holds tomorrow. I'm going to pray to Him. I'm going to thank Him with words. I'm going to go a step further. I'm going to pray to Him in the Spirit. Last verse for tonight before we launch into this. This is the last verse, and it's this one here. 
He says, come to me, all ye that are burdened, and I will give you rest. Can I say this? If we had a generation that prayed, I promise you, half of the worries, the depression diagnosis that we receive wouldn't happen. Come to me, all you that are burdened. You know what happens when you got burdens and you hang on to it like it's yours, like you own it? You got some stresses, because life will give you stresses. You test your foundation. You got no prayer life, and so you, you carry it. Eventually, you carry it to the point where you just, it's just too much. It's just too much. And tonight, before you leave this room, Anything that you are carrying, you do not have to leave here with it. If it's not from God, you do not. You see, you're not built to carry it like he was built to carry it. He carried it on the cross. Them nails through his hands, his feet, was so that you didn't you didn't have to carry it. Them stripes on his back. That thorn of crown crushed and pushed on his head. That spit that he had to stand there and, and I'm not talking transformation church, by the way, but that spit, that punch that he received that he endured, my man, he can carry it way better than you can carry it. So, Revive Church, can we stand on our feet tonight? Here's what we're going to do. Can I get the worship team up? I can just maybe get, just get this stuff all removed out of the way. I'll keep the water running. Thank you. Come to me, Jesus says. You that are burdened, and I will give you rest. There is nowhere in my Bible that I read that it says that I need to carry the weight. I need to carry, it says carry the cross, not, not the weight. It doesn't say carry the burden, it says carry the cross. Carry his name, not the burden. And so tonight, I'm going to pray for a few different groups of people, but I want to start out with this group right here. If you're here and you've, man, you, you've been carrying some stuff, would you come out of your seats right now to the front? Because we're going to pray, we're going to believe God for that thing to be removed off you. So if that's you, just come up to the front right now. Come up to the front right now. Whatever burden it is, come up to the front right now. Come up to the front right now. Don't be shy. This is, this is between you and God. Decide in your heart that I'd rather have it removed than be shy. Is there anyone else you carrying it? The burden, just come up to the front, up to the front over here. Come on now. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. That's you. A bit, a bit more forward. A bit more forward, please. A bit more forward. Come on down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says, He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Is free indeed. No matter what it is that you carry, I don't need to know it because He knows it. Just come to the front. For some of you, it's in your heart that you carry this. Resentment, disappointment, you can't build your life on disappointment. You can't build your life on resentment. It, it, it just won't go high enough. You need to let Him take it. Because that is not a foundation that you want to build a life on. So one last time, if that's you, I want to pray for every single one that's in front. Okay, come, come to the front a little bit more, thank you. If that's you, come to the front right now. Thank you, Jesus. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna worship. Give me uh, give me any of the songs that you were doing before the worship songs. 
for everyone that's standing there, I want you to worship. And while you're doing that, in this atmosphere of God's presence, believe God for something supernatural for your life. Allow God to process what you've just heard in your heart. Because for some of you, you might be, God's going to be saying, hey, I'm calling you into prayer. I'm calling you into intercession. Some of you, God's going to be challenging you on certain areas of your life. Every single one of you, God knows where He needs to meet you and He will meet you if you open your heart. So let's open our hearts, open our mouths. Let's worship Him. And as we do that, I'm going to be praying for everyone here. And then after that, I'll pray for another group of people as well. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go.